So, Pinky, please tell me something about the vowels. No, Fabio, I'm sorry, I can't. Why? You haven't studied either, huh? No, that's not the problem. I can't talk about vowels. I'm allergic. What? Allergic? Yeah, I suffer from irritable vowel syndrome. Last time we talked about consonants. We said that the consonants we had in the Germanic language were the result of a specific development of Indo-European sounds, called first consonant shift. As we explained, because of the tendency of Germanic speakers to start using the glottis later than expected, voiceless plosives became voiceless fricatives, voiced plosives became voiceless plosives, and finally, aspirated consonants became simple consonants, without aspiration. Today we talk about vowels, but first we need to know what the difference between a vowel and a consonant is. Do you know? Okay, I'll give you three seconds to guess. No, you don't know, so I will explain it. When we speak, we usually push air out of the lungs, <coughs> through the mouth or the nose and then outside. And we model the air flow by choosing a certain position for mouth, tongue, throat and so on. And each way we move these parts of our body produces a different sound. Every time we expel a small quantity of air, which corresponds to a syllable, most of the energy is used for the production of one specific sound, which is the heart of the syllable, while the other sounds represent just transitional sounds. Which doesn't mean they are less important, but still they are articulated using less energy than for the main ones. The result is that we have two categories of sounds. The first one consists of these transitional sounds, usually very short and where we have an increased air friction, because two parts of the mouth, by getting close to each other, slow the airflow in a specific way. In the second category, there are the main sounds, what we call the heart of the syllable, that is sounds where we spend most of the time needed to produce a syllable and whereby usually there's no friction. The air goes through the mouth without finding obstacles. So these sounds are perceived as softer than the transitional sounds we were talking about before. Well, the transitional sounds are the consonants, while the heart of the syllable is a vowel or a diphthong if there are two vowels pronounced in only one breath. This means, as a general rule, that every syllable contains only one vowel or a diphthong. Actually, if we want to use the exact scientific terms, we shouldn't say vowels and consonants, but vocoids and contoids. But for what concerns our subject, we can also use vowels and consonants without fear of being misinterpreted. After this basic phonetic explanation, let's go back to our topic. But before we talk about vowels in Germanic, as we did for the consonants, we need to know how the Indo-European vowels sounded like. And, of course, that's hard to say. First, because as we already know, Indo-European hasn't left any written evidence, nor recording. Secondly, because vowels are much less conservative than consonants. They changed a lot over the centuries, much faster than consonants did, Therefore, it's not easy to reconstruct them. For this reason, you have to know that the description of the Indo-European vocalism we're talking about is just a hypothesis, the likeliest one. But just for you to understand, lots of scholars have a completely different idea of the sounds of Indo-European. That said, let's see what the most common reconstruction of the Indo-European vowel system is. Most scholars think Indo-European had five vowels that could be short or long. These vowels were most probably similar to the sounds A, E, I, O, U. According to today's conventions, you will see only the symbol of the vowel if this one is short, or the symbol surmounted by a straight bar if long. A, E, I, O, U. In a pure phonetic transcription, if vowels are long, you can also see them followed by a colon. But that doesn't change anything. We're just talking about two different ways to express the same sounds. There were also consonants that in specific conditions behaved as vowels. 
they usually called sonorants. These sounds were n, m, l, r. You find something similar in modern languages, for example, krv, which means blood in Croatian, whereby r is the heart of the syllable, that is the vowel in this case. Or German schreiben, meaning to write, whereby one syllable is schrei and the other one is m, where m works as a vowel. Is that all? No. In some books you can also read that there was another vowel, that is e, called schwa, which evolved differently in the Indo-European languages, but usually it became a, while e in a few Asian languages, like Sanskrit. Actually, this is kind of true, but it is a huge simplification of a much more complicated situation. Today, most scholars think there was no simple e, but three different mysterious consonants called laryngeals because they were produced in the rearmost part of the mouth, in the throat, we can say. We don't know exactly what they sounded like, but it must have been something like h or r. I'm not gonna explain you now why sometimes you use square brackets, sometimes slash bars. For the moment, just take it as the same thing. These three laryngeal sounds could become, in some contexts, sonorants. That is, they could behave as vowels. In this case, as we don't know exactly how they were pronounced, as an approximation we can generally refer to the three sounds as uh, 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 to finish with the Indo-European vowel system, we had diphthongs, composed by A, E or O as the first element, and E or U as a second element, in a combination of six diphthongs, I, A, OI, AU, EU, O. In these diphthongs, the second element was always short. The first one could be short, but also long. I, A, O, I, A, U, E, U, O. For a total of 12 diphthongs. Let's recap. We have five vowels in their short version A, E, I, O, U. And in their long version A, E, I, O, U. Then we have a number of laryngeal sounds that we will refer to as e and that are always short. We have four consonants that can behave as vowels l, r, n, m, and finally the 12 diphthongs. Let's see now what happens to these sounds in Germanic. When we talk about vowel evolution, it's a good idea for the moment to focus on stressed vowels. Not because I'm lazy, but just stressed vowels are those vowels that mostly preserve a certain quality. We will see that Germanic tends to flatten the quality, that is the sound, of all vowels in weak or unstressed position, or even to drop unstressed syllables altogether, which makes it much harder to study and analyze them. Stressed vowels are mostly preserved, even if some of them changed when Germanic emerged from Indo-European. The most important change was that A and O were confused. But not just randomly, it was not like just choose one of them, it's the same. No. Long vowels A and O merged into O, while the short vowels A and O merged into A. How can you memorize this? Well, imagine you're working out. If you have to make an intense effort of brief duration, that is possible. But if this effort lasts longer, you need to use less energy, otherwise you'll end up with a barbell on your chest. A is an open vowel, it requires more energy, an effort you can make only for a short time. But if the vowel has a longer duration, then you need to close the mouth and save energy in order to make this effort last longer, and you don't produce A but O. As a result, if one of these two vowels was short, then they were able to pronounce a fully open sound, A. If the vowel was long, they had to close it to O. Let's see some examples. In Indo-European, we have the reconstructed root SAL, which means salt. And in ancient Greek, we have HALS, which means the same and is the same root. We have laid in SAL. And in English as well, we have SALT, but it was pronounced before SALT. 
a short O becomes A. And we see that in the reconstructed root for the number 8 in Indo-European octo, where the first O, which is short, is still O, for example, in ancient Greek, octo, in Latin as well, octo, but not in Germanic, where it was achto, and still today we have in German acht. A long A sound in Indo-European becomes in Germanic O. For example, we have the root mater, which means mother, and in Latin it doesn't change, mater, but in Proto-Germanic it becomes mother. Indo-European long O is still long O in Germanic. For example, the Indo-European root blo, which means flower or bloom, is in Latin floreo, and in Proto-Germanic blomo. Another sound that developed in a rather confusing way is e, that is long e. It looks like there were no important changes in the beginning, but then it opened to a or a in West and North Germanic. So, for example, we have Indo-European ge, which means to go, which became in an early stage of Northwest Germanic gan with different vowel sounds in the modern languages that messed up everything. All the other vowels are pretty much the same in Indo-European and Proto-Germanic. For example, short E is E in Indo-European, but also in Germanic. See the Indo-European root Kel, which means hide, and is in Latin Kelo, and Old English Helan. Short E is still I, pisk of Indo-European which means fish, is piscis in Latin, and fish in English. Long E is still long E in Germanic. For example, Indo-European swig, which means silence, gave Greek sige, and Old English swigian. U didn't change, both long and short. See, for example, the Indo-European root hrud, which means red, and we have Latin rubius, Ancient Greek erythros, English ruddy, which was pronounced before ruddy. Moose in Indo-European, that was mouse, is in Latin moose, in Ancient Greek moose, in Old English moose. Let's go now to that Indo-European e coming from the laryngeal sonorants. It evolved to a, not only in Germanic, but also in all other European languages. See Indo-European pater, which becomes Lerin Pater and Germanic Father. The sonorants simply evolved by adding an U sound before. A very common example is the negative prefix N, which becomes IN in Latin. For example, see the difference between sanus and insanus, healthy and unhealthy. But UN in the Germanic languages. Still today we have in English known and unknown, which is written UN before it was pronounced UN, and it is still pronounced UN in other Germanic languages, like German, for example. Another example is the Indo European root WULK, meaning wolf, and giving WULFAS in Proto Germanic, compare it with Latin LUPUS or ancient Greek LUKOS. Diphthongs behave like two short vowels in a row in their development from Indo-European to Germanic. So we have, for example, Indo-European oi becomes in Proto-Germanic ai. For example, oinos, that was the number one in Indo-European, is in Proto-Germanic einas, from which English one and German eins. Indo-European rope, which means whole, is in Germanic rauf. So short O has become A and short U has become U. And we find, for example, Old Icelandic Rauf. The only diphthong that diverges from the evolution of the single vowels is Indo-European A, which becomes in Proto-Germanic E. For example, we have already seen the Indo-European root Steig, which means to climb, in Proto-Germanic Stigana, in Gothic we have seen Stiran, but also we have today German Steigen. 
Scholars agree that Proto-Germanic developed some vocalic features that seem not to have been present in the Indo-European reconstruction, that is nasal vowels. Nasal vowels are produced by letting air flow not only through the mouth, but also through the nose at the same time. But we will not talk much about these, because these are usually just the contraction of a vowel with a nasal consonant, that is N or a M. These sounds were found 90% of times at the end of the words and disappeared completely in modern Germanic languages. And you can find them in the transcriptions either with this phonetic symbol over the vowel, for example, an, on, um, or with a short comma under the vowel. We have already seen an example in Indo-European Kumtom, Proto-Germanic Hundam. Okay, so this was just a quick overview. And maybe you realize that I focused mostly on Germanic reconstructed roots and not much on modern languages. Just because vowels changed a lot from Germanic to today's languages. Nevertheless, vowels are of paramount importance because we will see in Germanic verbs the alternation of vowels is one of the ways to go from a tense to the other. For example, from present to past or participle. But this is another topic. In the next lesson, we will see in what extent accent changes caused a real revolution in Germanic. That's it for the moment. See you and behave yourselves.